became a bit of an exilio histérico uh, in their times, there are times cruel rejection of Marian refugees. This phenomenon has been well studied by Cuban American social scientists like Alejandro Portes, Silvia Pedraza, as many of you know. Uh, curiously, on the other side of the Florida Straits, the reaction was similar, although magnified. An article by Lourdes Casal, it was also titled Cuba, Abril, Mayo, 1980, La Historia y la Histeria, History and Hysterics. And it was illustrated with photos of Cuba's reaction to Mariel, as Abel Sierra Madero was speaking, La Marcha del Pueblo Combatiente. Um, one million Cubans marched in Havana, as you saw in the pictures, um, in support of the revolution and against the delinquents and the lumpen. And actually, what happened was that I had first personal testimony from my cousins, because my cousin, my female cousin, was working in a, in a clinic. Uh, in a health clinic in La Baria, in El Cerro, in Havana. And then when they found out that she was leaving on a boat, they organized un acto de repudio. And that was my first contact with, with actos de repudio. Um, her co-workers organized that, and they called her gusanos, antisociales, escoria, all those epithets that, that Abel talked about in the first part of the program. And, and, and it, was, it was new to me. Um, my cousin uh, was a gay man who had escaped the UMAP, the Unidad uh, Militares de Ayuda a la Producción, because he was a ballet dancer, and then he was traveling with Alberto Alonso all over the world, and then he didn't have to go to the UMAP. So that is really um, uh, my memory of the Mariel. It's all the anguish and the joy of seeing them, and the sadness, and the separation, and the reliving one more time all that we had gone through, through the first waves. As I told you, we had come in the 60s, in the 70s, in Camarioca, in the Freedom Flights, through Mexico, and now finally we were together through Mariel. And all those waves of immigration are part of that large and continuing exodus. We see people arriving in Miami Beach even last month, you know, a full boat now brought back in the form of our own kin, who would forever be known as Marielitos in the literature and in the media and in the imagination of a people. As the book from the Cuban Research Institute Conference Proceedings in 2013, edited by Jorge Duani, well expresses, we Cubans are un pueblo disperso. We are a dispersed people. Y el Mariel es uno de los puntos claves de esa dispersión que continúa hasta el día de hoy. In other words, Mariel is one of those key points of this version that continues through today. That was my contact with Mariel. It was very personal, but it also made me think a lot of this continuity of Cubans leaving their place of birth. Um, and now we will proceed to the papers, the presentation by our colleagues. And I am very uh, happy to be able to find <laughs> Maybe the pages that they gave me to introduce them. Yes. First we have Eduardo Gamarra, who is a professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Florida International. He previously served as director of FIU's Latin American and Caribbean Center. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of Pittsburgh. His areas of expertise include Latin American politics, democratization, and neopopulism. Dr. Gamarra is the author, co-author, and editor of numerous books, including Bolivia on the Brink, Centro America 2020, or 2020, Un Nuevo Modelo de Desarrollo Regional, and The Colombian Diaspora in South Florida. And in 1980, he worked as a counsel for the Maria refugees in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Let me also introduce the other members of the panel. Jesus Barquet is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Languages and Linguistics at New Mexico State University. He holds a PhD and an MA in Spanish from the Tulane University, and a BA in Hispanic Language and Literature from the University of Havana. He is the author of several books of literary essays and poetry, including Teatro y Revolución Cubana, Subversión y Utopía en los Siete Contrateos de Antonio Rufat, and Sin Fecha de Extinción. He is co-editor of the anthology Todo Parecía, Poesía Cubana Contemporánea de Temas Gays y Lésbicos, que por cierto se presenta en Books and Books el martes. Yeah? Y Hugh Gladwin is Associate Professor of... el lunes, perdón. Hugh Gladwin is Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology in the Department of Global and Social Cultural Studies at Florida International. He previously served as Director of the Institute for Public Opinion Research at FIU. 
His major area of research is the application of survey research and GIS tools to understand large urban settings of high cultural and demographic diversity. Since 1991, he has co-directed with Guillermo Grenier, ¿cierto? The FIU Cuba Poll, which is the longest running research project on the changing public opinions of Cuban Americans in Miami toward Cuba. And then our first speaker is Dr. Camarra. Thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here and to uh, uh, share this, uh, this event with, uh, with such distinguished people. I, I love the, the first panel. It was, uh, I think, just an outstanding uh, collection of, uh, of uh, three presentations that uh, really took me back a, a, long, a, lo a lot of years that, um, um, right there at Fort Chaffee. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to see uh, 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 Mr. Ciro del Castillo, who doesn't remember me because I was a 22-year-old kid when he was already a very important man uh, and somebody who played a, a crucial, very distinguished role uh, with the Maria Alexa. So I'm, I'm delighted that you're here uh, today. And, uh, um, what I'd like to do in the, in the course of the afternoon, in the course of my, my, uh, my few minutes, is uh, uh, is try to go back to 1980 and, uh, and then come forward. But uh, what I'd like to do in that process, I'll basically tell you why I was in Arkansas and how it is that I got to, to Fort Chaffee, first of all. Um, I'm a Bolivian. Uh, I was a distance runner, and uh, I, had, I was on scholarship as a distance runner at the University of Arkansas. Arkansas happens to be a, a pretty good track team. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I was, uh, I was born at 12,000 feet, so I, I was often referred to as a short guy, you know, with um, uh, lungs with legs. Uh, but uh, uh, arrived at Arkansas and uh, finished a, a degree there. And uh, just about as I was leaving um, to the University of Pittsburgh to pursue a PhD degree, uh, the Mariel Exodus uh, uh, occurred. And of course, uh, at the time, Arkansas had no not really, uh, you know, uh, many Latin Americans. Today it's interesting, but uh, some towns in Arkansas, uh, Springdale, for example, just north of Fayetteville, has a population of 60% Mexicans, largely working in the, in the chicken industry there. So, so what, uh, what happened in Arkansas in 1980, though, was really quite, uh, quite sensational. All of a sudden, within a period of two weeks, 19,000 Cubans uh, arrived at Fort Chaffee passing through a little town called Barling, right out of Fort Smith, the second largest city. Uh, but all of a sudden, overnight, uh, the U.S. government had created a, a small town there uh, of, uh, of basically people who spoke Spanish and who came from an island st stigmatized twice. Stigmatized first by, uh, by Cubans, uh, stigmatized by everything we just heard, uh, Lascoria, all of the things that, that you heard uh, from, our, from our previous presentations. So stigmatized as they left, and then re-stigmatized as they arrived. And when they arrived in Arkansas, they had been stigmatized, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be controversial at times, so I, I apologize for it. Um, they were stigmatized uh, first by the media, uh, and uh, stigmatized, in fact, by accepting much of what the Cuban government was saying about these people. Uh, they were criminals, they were mental patients, they were all of the things that, that uh, they were described. And of course the good ones, as they were filtered, the good ones stayed in Miami and all of the bad ones went to Fort Chaffee and, for, and Eglin and they went to Fort McCoy and they went to Fort Indian Town Gap. And so all of those with families that stayed here and all of the real Escoria arrived at Fort Chaffee. So as they got off the bus, as they got off the bus from the airplane, you could basically sense this. The people in Arkansas were basically saying, you know, you have sent us to those Escoria, to those animals. And we're here to, you know, we're supposed to somehow protect them. How is it that Bill Clinton has allowed this to happen? How is it that the mayor of, of Fort Smith, and how is it, of course, that John Paul Hammerschmidt, the, uh, the representative uh, uh, in Congress, had in fact accepted this from the U.S. government? So, so this is sort of uh, the context. And I, I have a... 
uh, a chronology here that, that I just want to, I'm not going to go through this, it's just for, for background, but, but what, what I'd like to go through in my, in my narrative today very briefly is, you know, uh, in, in your presentation you talked about this idea, you know, in a sense this was the new Camarioca, uh, trips to, 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 to Costa Rica, this new air bridge that was going to be produced, uh, Bernardo Venez, whom, whom uh, I've, I've had a, a, a wonderful uh, relationship with over many, many years, uh, and, and his role there, the, 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 the fact that the Peruvian embassy took place. But then came Key West. Then came Tamiami, the park right here, mm -hmm. which is one of the places where we processed uh, 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 refugees. The Orange Bowl, I-95, Eglin, Fort Chaffee, Fort McCoy, Fort Indian Town Gap. And then came consolidation, and CEDO is very familiar with consolidation. So if you think about it, right, I said, twice stigmatized, now they became three times stigmatized. Because now, not only had we stigmatized them coming out of Cuba, stigmatized them because they went to Fort Chaffee, the unsponsorable ones. And the ones that became, that received that, you know, these, these people that had a... A, a, a parolee status with no real, as, as Cito described, really years in the making before they formally got a, a legal status in the United States. But then came consolidation. All of those who couldn't be sponsored out of Fort Jaffe, Eglin, and, and McCoy and elsewhere, now were going to be consolidated at Fort Jaffe because these were the difficult cases that we couldn't sponsor out. And then, of course, we also opened El Centro, the detention camp in California in the middle of the desert and the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Uh, I was privileged to work in, in all of these places. I, I, I worked first at Fort Chaffee for, for a year. Uh, uh, saw, uh, I, I was there on May the 7th and, and left uh, uh, a year later. In June, I went to El Centro where I was asked to re-interview sponsorship breakdowns. And then uh, I had the, uh, uh, I, I, won't, I won't really call it a privilege because it was more like a nightmare, I had to re-interview people at the federal penitentiary uh, in, in Atlanta. So, so uh, for a young man of 22 years old who had just been a, a distance runner and not much experience other than that, uh, it was uh, quite a trial by fire. So uh, I always, I was telling, in fact, uh, uh, Sebastian that you know, my, my life changed dramatically there in, uh, in 1980. Uh, by the decisions of two people. One was Fidel, who let them out, and then the other was Bill Clinton, who let them in. Uh, and Bill Clinton was, uh, in fact, uh, as an international student, as a Bolivian international student, he had served as our host family uh, in, uh, at, at Fayetteville. So I've had this long kind of very interesting relationship with the Clintons, and I've had the opportunity to kind of reminisce with him about Fort Chaffee, uh, now working with him in, in Haiti. So. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, El Centro was, was a place where we re-interviewed re people, right? All these sponsorship breakdowns that I, that I want to talk about in a, in a few moments. And uh, these were, you know, these were uh, individuals who had already been let out and who had, for some reason, one reason or another, uh, their, 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 uh, their uh, sponsors had broken down. But it was also people who, in a sense, you know, had even come to Miami, uh, relatives who had kicked them out, or had been arrested and sent to the to, to this to this detention center, where they met up with uh, immigrants, predominantly from Mexico, and it was really quite fascinating because there was about 160 Cubans that I had to, that I that I interviewed, and they were in the context of about 400 Mexicans, and uh, Mexicans who were coming in and being deported, and so they were there for relatively short periods of time. The Cubans were not there for short periods of time because of a very significant decision that was made. Uh, very early on, the decision was made, first, you can't deport Cubans. And so because you can't deport Cubans, right, something that I want to get back to in the course of my presentation, a decision was made, a policy decision was made, that even if they already satisfied their, you know, whatever it was that they were convicted of, they would not be released and would be held indefinitely. Mm -hmm. uh, indefinitely means, you know, in some cases, decades. Uh, in, 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 in some cases, uh, it meant really until the Supreme Court ruled in 2005, mm -hmm. Clark versus Martinez, 
that the U.S. government could not hold Mariel refugees in, indefinitely. Right? Based on case law, but, but nonetheless, as we know, this also has some relevance for our current discussion about the war on terror, where we're also holding people indefinitely. And Mariel, I think, was maybe it was earlier, but Mariel was one of the first times in which the U.S. held people indefinitely, uh, long after they had, uh, they had uh, uh, satisfied uh, their sentences and, and essentially could not be released out into the, into the, popu into the uh, community with a fear, of course, that they would be a danger to, to the community. And, uh, you know, that was, of course, always a kind of a controversial thing. Now, let me move forward very quickly because uh, I, don't have, I don't have much time. And I want to say two things. Uh, one, uh, who were they and where are they now? Right? And I want to sort of talk about a few people. I'm not a political scientist, not an anthropologist. And uh, I went back and I, I, I dragged out a, a, an incredible amount of interviews that I had with Fort Chaffee uh, and, and El Centro uh, migrants. I, my, my, in fact, one of my very first publications was in Cuban studies uh, in, in, the, in the early 80s. And uh, I went back to some of the, the, the research that I did for that project, and I came up upon a couple of cases, and I want to sort of use these as a back, backdrop to what, I, to what I want to eventually say here. Uh, you can't, I don't think, you, unless you have very good eyesight, you're not going to be able to read that. So let me, let me just tell you the story of Ramon. Ramon came into my office one day. I, I was uh, uh, working at their locator uh, service in, at the Red Cross in Fort Chaffee. And what we used to do was basically look in, the, in these incredibly long, uh, uh, very, very big books that had, there were computer printouts of all of the refugees who would, who would come in. And we would try to basically match these refugees with little pieces of paper that they brought of relatives either in Miami or wherever they, 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 they said they were. Uh, Ramon came in and he said, I have a brother in, in Miami. And, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, this was a real problem because he hadn't found his brother leaving Miami and was put on the plane and put into Fort Jaffe. And so Ramon said, you know, my brother lives in, in Miami. Could you please call him? And that's essentially what my job was. We called and I, I talked to his brother. And his brother told me, um, first time I talked to him, is he standing next to you? And I said, no, he's in the barracks. Well, uh, I have to tell you something. Um, and this apropos of the discussion on race, which I think is very, very important. Uh, Ramon's brother was his own, only his half-brother, he said. But he lived in Coral Gables. And I, frankly, I had no idea where Coral Gables was at the time. To me, it was just like any, any other place in Florida. And he said, you know, and in Coral Gables, you know, um, it won't look good if I bring my brother. Because my brother, because he's only a half-brother, is, is dark. Uh, and he's black. And, uh, and uh, you know, um, I'll have a very, very difficult time uh, bringing him to my house in, uh, in Miami. So is there any way that you can possibly tell him that, uh, that you didn't find, find me? Well, you know, it's not, not easy to tell somebody that, you know, your brother doesn't, doesn't want you. So what I did was I, I called Ramon in and I said, look, we did find your brother. Uh, legally, I have to tell you that your brother does not want to sponsor you. And uh, so, uh, but we did find a sponsor for him in Seattle. Um, we sent him to Seattle with a group of older uh, Cubans. And, uh, uh, and for years, I, uh, I often thought about what Ramon was up to. Until one day, I found Ramon coming out of Publix here. And he stopped me and he said, you know, uh, uh, you're you're Gamarra from from uh, from uh, from Fort Chaffee, and I said yes. You know who, who are you? I'm Ramon, the guy you sent to Seattle. And uh, so um, uh, I began uh, this communications. Um, I guess over uh, the course of three years uh, with with Ramon, and Ramon was interesting because his his memories of Fort Chaffee were very fond, and they were fond because we had allowed him to leave Fort Chaffee. He eventually made his way back to down to Miami. Uh, never encountered his brother, um, and uh, died in 2008. Um, I, I called to find out how he was doing, and found out that he had that he had passed away. So Ramon is 
one of those cases of, of, of an individual who came here, tried to find his relatives, and didn't, and didn't uh, quite make it, uh, uh, but, uh, but found a job and was very, very productive. La Familia Montes. Um, two Cuban doctors who came to, to, to Fort Chaffee. Again, they came out of, out of Miami because they couldn't find their relatives. They ended up in, in, uh, in Fort Chaffee. We helped them find uh, uh, Maria's, uh, uh, Maria's sister. They were sponsored here in Miami. They finally came with their, with their young daughter. I also found them here in Miami um, uh, several decades later. Um, their daughter is a graduate of FIU. She's now a very successful attorney. Uh, I've changed the, the last name. They didn't want me to, to identify him. I just, I just had a nice conversation with them. Uh, so they opened up a, uh, they didn't, they were never able to get their, their, uh, their uh, medical uh, licenses, but uh, like many, many Cubans before Mariel, they also had a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit and opened up a whole series of businesses, including a car wash here on, on, on Kendall Drive, uh, which I often frequent. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and so they've been, you know, that example of a very successful family. Uh, five minutes. Um, and I'm giving you kind of pictures of the people that, 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 I, that we saw and the different examples of Julia. Julia was a young man. That was the name this young man had chosen to, uh, to leave uh, uh, Fort Chaffee. A uh, young uh, gay man. Um, who uh, was sponsored by the uh, San Francisco Metropolitan Church, uh, a church out of, out of San Francisco that, that came in and after a long process of negotiations with the government actually convinced the government to, to allow it to sponsor uh, uh, gay men um, and, and primarily to the West Coast. Well, the, the interesting story, I mean, uh, you know, was that uh, Julia, came, Julia came in we, we, we secured the sponsorship. Uh, I was doing all of the paperwork with the INS. And then one day the husband came in and uh, Raul uh, would not let Julia leave unless he left with her. And uh, 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 we, of course, uh, had to explain to Raul that he had to sign some documents saying that he was, uh, uh, he was homosexual and uh, to, to allow him to leave. Uh, but Raul refused to do that. And, uh, the, the tragedy of Raul is that uh, in not signing that document, not only was he not sponsored out of Chaffee, but when he was eventually let out, um, uh, I, I then re-interviewed him uh, many, many uh, months later, but now at, uh, at the Atlanta Penitentiary. And uh, uh, he ended up um, uh, in Talladega and then uh, eventually um, spawned, uh, uh, deported many, many years. To, uh, to Cuba, so, so uh, 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 sort of the, the downside of the, of the story. Mr. Huidobro, another element, another segment of this population that, I, again, we, we kind of, I think, in, in personalizing them, you really get a sense of who these people were. Mr. Huidobro was uh, approximately 75 years of age, uh, came, I, Frankly, he never, never knew why he had come. He had just, you know, gotten the enthusiasm of leaving and arrived with no relatives. He said he had relatives, but we, we could never find him, uh, find any of his relatives. Eventually, uh, we sponsored him out to the Little Sisters of the Poor in Detroit. I corresponded with him for many years, and he died at, at 80 uh, in, in, two, in, uh, in 1985. Uh, and then uh, the unaccompanied minors. This was an extraordinary group, and uh, because it was a large, it was a large group of young, primarily men, who had probably the most difficult time at the camp. And uh, uh, and I just want to tell one story of Joaquin. Uh, Joaquin uh, uh, was uh, one of these young men uh, who was sponsored out, and he was sponsored out by a by a professor in one of the local universities uh, in uh, in Arkansas. Um, all he wanted was to get out, and when he got out, first thing he did was he left his sponsor and came to Miami. And in Miami, he ran into trouble with the law, he was arrested, and his, his sponsor was able to, to secure legal representation for him. And uh, 
while, while he did not go to, to Atlanta, he went through the legal process in the U.S., avoided Atlanta largely because of the role his sponsor played. Today, Joaquin visits me frequently. Um, he has two children, uh, and his sponsor um, managed to keep him in Arkansas for many, many years. They then moved to, they then moved to California. Uh, and uh, Joaquin is an example of somebody who did not come to Miami, as most did, but who has been extraordinarily successful uh, in, his, in his personal life. Uh, final observation uh, about race. Uh, as the consolidation grew, Fort Chaffee became much more African descendant. And this is a, a very logical thing um, that, uh, that occurred. I don't think it was a random act of, uh, of, uh, of discrimination. It, it was that basically, you know, most uh, Afro descendants did not have relatives in the United States and therefore had a very difficult time finding, finding sponsors. As consolidation came, and those whom I interviewed in El Centro, and those whom I interviewed in Atlanta, tended to be darker as well, you know, and, uh, and I think that, you know, it's a, it's a product of, uh, of uh, yes, the different waves that came, but it's also a product of this, maybe, you know, uh, one of the real stigmas of, 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 of Mariel was race, and, and it continues to be a, a, a stigma of, of, of Mariel. Let me conclude by, by making a a couple of very, very quick observations. What, you know, 35 years later, this, this double stigma or triple stigma or quadruple stigma, however you want to look at it, is finally wearing off 35 years later. It's finally wearing off and it's probably war, 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 uh, wearing off not, not to those of you who experienced the, uh, the, uh, the exodus, but to your children and your grandchildren, who now kind of look at Mariel not with shame, but with pride. And I, and I say that, you know, just by virtue of the number of, of Marielitos that I've been able to interview, whose children tell me that they, you know, they have this incredible sense of pride of, 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 of their parents and their grandparents. Psychologists that I worked with at the time used to always tell me, you know, these are the people who are, the, and, and Cito may remember the, the warnings of the psychologists at Fort Chaffee, you know, these people will never make it. They, uh, they're going to have a very difficult time, et cetera, et cetera. We now know that uh, while they were, uh, they had challenges, the bulk of the Mario refugees are very productive citizens in, in the United States today. Secondly, we know that they did have a labor market impact, a very positive labor market impact. And we, we now know from several studies by, by, uh, by a number of different uh, colleagues that the labor market impact in Florida was, was extraordinarily positive, especially, especially in Miami. And, uh, and I'm going to cut into kind of what, what, what Hugh is going to talk about in a moment, but the political impact of Mariel, I think we're only now beginning to really see it. Because it almost seems as there's a threshold moment pre and post 1980 in terms of political identification. And there are some interesting studies that are coming out, and what we'll see is, uh, uh, for example, you know, just simply in terms of, of identification with the Republican Party, right? There appears to be now increasing evidence that the Parteaguas is about 1980, pre and post, uh, and and in part perhaps it's because the Marielitos were economic refugees rather than political refugees in part because they grew up under Fidel and not, and not, uh, and not uh, you know, uh, uh, didn't have that, that uh, very close relationship with the, with the Cuban community that, that, uh, that uh, came before them. Uh, we also know that uh, in terms of their support for different, uh, and you'll, you'll talk about this of course, you know, uh, I'm going to end now, in terms, of, uh, in terms of their support for, for different issues, we know from the, from the Cuba poll, of course, how uh, how also the Cuban, the, the, the Marielitos, appear to be uh, more closely uh, related to, uh, to, uh, 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 to views of, uh, of opening and uh, especially reestablishing relations to Cuba. Uh, I'll, I'll end it there simply to say, you know, that, that I think uh, uh, to me it was a, it was a, it was a privilege to work uh, at, uh, with, with the Marielitos. Um, when, I, when I started working at Fort Chaffee, um, one of the things that everybody used to tell me is, you know, 
Uh, the last place anybody after working at Fort Chevy wants to work or wants to live is in Miami because all these people are going back there. And that was something that I heard all the time in, in, in Fort Chaffee. But when I got the job at FIU, I often thought of that. And, uh, and, and you know, now today that many Marielitos children, uh, the children of many Marielitos have been my students, my colleagues, and so on. Uh, you know, just in retrospect, uh, again, thank you, Jorge, uh, for inviting me to kind of reminisce on this stuff. I'm way out of my league in terms of the anthropology work that I tried to do there. But, uh, but I think... Uh, Again, uh, uh, what a privilege it, it has been to, to share some of these views with you this afternoon. Buenas tardes. Eh, yo voy a hablar sobre la revelar relevancia temática de la producción cultural del Mariel, fundamentalmente literatura y dentro de literatura, narrativa, testimonio, ensayo eh, eh, para la literatura cubana en general no la del exilio en particular, sino en general y no me gusta distinguir entre exilio y producción dentro de Cuba porque cuando hablamos de modernismo o romanticismo en Cuba en el siglo XIX no hablamos del modernismo del exilio el modernismo de Cuba, hablando de Casal y Martí sino simplemente hablamos del modernismo como, como la literatura cubana entonces me gusta hablar en general de la literatura cubana en general escrita fuera dentro de Cuba como un solo corpus, con muchas voces. En ese sentido, me interesa eh, este tema de la relevancia temática del Mariel porque muchos temas que han salido en los años 90 y 2000 en la literatura cubana, sobre todo la producida dentro de Cuba, de alguna forma ya estaban elaborados en la literatura del Mariel. Y voy a re reducirme también a la producción de los años 80, precisamente para indicar... Te eh, epocalmente esta producción antes como anticipo de otros de temas que después se van a desarrollar mucho más dentro de Cuba y hasta fuera de Cuba y cuando hablo del Mariel no me limito a los que vinieron en barco como yo, sino también el Mariel como el año 80 que fue como un año clave que nucleó no solamente a los que vinimos por el Mariel sino también una serie de exilios individuales por ejemplo en Benítez Rojo Padilla, intelectuales que vinieron por su cuenta por una u otra vía uno o dos años antes del 80, uno o dos años después del 80, incluso eh, toda esa, una, una enorme cantidad de presos, de presos políticos que habían cumplido su prisión por 20 años, qué sé yo, y llegaron también en esa fecha del 80. Entonces todo ese grupo confluye, y había poetas, escritores, eh, narradores, en, en esos tres grupos, el de, los, el de los presos que vienen por ser presos políticos, el de los exiliados individuales que llegan por otras vías, como en los casos que mencioné, y el de los que venimos en, vinimos en el Mariel. Todo eso confluye y no creo que sea arbitrario unirlos en un mismo grupo porque lo que nos unía era más que lo que nos separaba, que si viniste en barco, viniste en avión. Eso resultaba irrelevante ante todo lo que nos unía, que era la experiencia de 20 años de práctica del gobierno de Fidel Castro en Cuba. Y haber percibido la realidad de una forma u otra, en ese sentido yo no concuerdo con que éramos emigrantes económicos, éramos políticos. Recordemos que en Cuba, en ese momento, la sexualidad era política, la religión era política, 